Stephen, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, Nick, Rob, uh, thank you also for the CIFA for uh, making it possible for me to be here in Newcastle, first time I'm here. Um, uh, I would like to point out that I'm, uh, as you know, non, uh, not only non-UK based, but non-UK at all. Uh, so maybe uh, things will look a bit different. Um, and also um, that I am not a commercial or, uh, uh, or whatever. I'm a professional archaeologist in the sense that I'm not an amateur, unfortunately, and that I'm uh, relatively uh, okay with what I'm doing, but I'm not uh, related to archaeology as an industry or as a business. Uh, so that means that I'm twice, uh, twice remote or twice alien, possibly, and that means that I can benefit uh, from a double dose of indulgence from your part um, if what I'm going to say will be a little bit too uh, um, provocative, maybe, or uh, I don't think off the mark, but maybe uh, excessive uh, in, my, uh, in my comments and reflections on this issue of uh, Brexit. And I will also show, uh, mark my word, you, you mentioned navel-gazing. I will show you my last slides will be uh, navel gazing uh, à la française, uh, which I hope will encourage you to do the same. <coughs> so, uh, the first part of uh, our present joint presentation is um, I will address the question of whether Brexit was at all uh, predictable from a heritage uh, archaeology point of view, not 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 uh, generally speaking. Um, and then Kenny will come and uh, say. Um, something about the relation between uh, UK archaeology and EU archaeology in the two directions. Yes, that, that was, uh, that, that's what's going to be in the PowerPoint. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I will come back and um, uh, I will come back and, and um, address the question of uh, what are the possible impacts of um, impact implications of Brexit on European archaeology. Um, looking at it from a Eurocentric, can one say positively? Yeah, in a positive sense, Eurocentric perspective, uh, and then some conclusions, including um, naval gazing. So the question, was Brexit predictable with regards to archaeology and heritage, is of course a tricky one, um, and uh, I will obviously have to be very uh, quick about this, uh, but I think in general that the observation, uh, the, the, the proportion or the relation or the role of the nation state, uh, its uh, gradual reduction. Um, uh, it is certainly a feature that uh, is relevant, is perceptible both on, on uh, heritage management uh, issues um, and, and that has uh, its implications. Uh, one of the ways of looking at it, the, so the, the reliance on common sense, on social pressure, uh, the um, encouragement of the laissez-faire attitude, if I pronounce it correctly, laissez-faire attitude, <laughs> um, uh, the hidden hand, <coughs> Uh, is is, um, is certainly a relevant matter, and more than that. Yeah, sorry, was Brexit predictable? So this is the the photographs, uh, not the one that we uh, put on, uh, but the one from the same demonstration in France about uh, archaeologists, uh, you know, out in the streets. And uh, was Brexit predictable, heritage uh, archaeology and heritage wise? And um, uh, one of the uh, one of the ones who needs the expert. And uh, I don't know if John John is here. I saw him yesterday. John Scofield? No? Um, uh, there is, of course, a link between um, uh, who needs experts in the domain of heritage and archaeology and who needs the experts uh, in the domain of uh, you know, general management of, uh, of a country. Uh, and it seems to me that, uh, again, being provocative about it, is there is a, a similar uh, type of tendency of um, somehow um, a, a, a willingness, uh, even a sort of glee, a uh, sort of irresponsible uh, desire to to um, encourage uh, anybody uh, or anything or anyone uh, who might have opinions on this. Uh, so John Scofield, of course, it just, it just happens to have published a book, but a lot of other colleagues here, uh, Adrian Olivier from English uh, and a lot of number of other people have this, um, um, this um, tendency to, to, um, uh, to um, empower in, uh, in, a, in a disempowering way for their own uh, expertise and, 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 uh, and, and competences. We don't need the experts. Uh, uh, we can uh, challenge the authority of the experts. Uh, and as, as uh, the lady said here, uh, the real expert, the expert that matters are, of course, the people. Uh, the second point uh, is the issue of, um, of community, of the stakeholders. Uh, and again, this thing that from France looks very, very bizarre, the portable antiquity scheme and the idea of, uh, um, of lo local people being allowed to uh, 
uh, to uh, uncover and to uh, destroy the context of archaeological uh, objects of which uh, zero point something percent or 97 percent is not being recorded. It's been recently published again um, on the, um, uh, the weakness of, of a system that relies on the goodwill and the common purpose uh, of well-meaning individuals, uh, which we all are, but it doesn't always work like this. Okay, so uh, individualism and, and, and sectorianism at uh, play. Um, the outcome of this, yeah, the outcome of this uh, is uh, something that I see from the, again from the outside uh, as uh, localism gone mad. It is as if uh, as if uh, half the population of the country uh, who voted uh, for Brexit, together with your uh, unprincipled uh, politicians, uh, uh, behave as if they are a local community. Uh, and uh, some of the responsibilities and the uh, connections and the links that have been uh, produced for decades uh, can be waived uh, as if one was uh, you know, a little uh, village with a little uh, issue about some sort of heritage uh, concern. Uh, that's the way uh, it seems to me from the outside. So now I, I pass over to Kenny for his point of view and then I come back from my point of view. Okay, thank you, Nick. Just so you know, I haven't seen any of Nathan's slides, so I didn't know what he was going to be saying. This is, this is, this is proper pre-rehearsed uh, presentation. Okay. First thing was to think, I'm, um, I'm coming at this from the, my perspective, is the, what the effects of Brexit will be on European archaeology. My first point, no, no, my whole point is that I think Britain leaving the European Union will not have a great effect on European archaeology. I think Britain has, in the past, had significant influence in the way that European archaeology heritage practice has developed. That was in the past. That was that was the Valletta Convention. We, the Valletta Convention wouldn't look like what it looks like if it wasn't for PPG 16, if it wasn't for Jeff Wainwright, as he puts it, writing both of them. But those days are past now. And so now just a quick think about what effects us flying away will have on European archaeology, European archaeology practice. Right. Now, this is the point that Kevin started to make about the numbers of Europe. Of the, first of all, many EU archaeologists work in, in the European, in UK, relatively many. We have specific figures of, about that from the last Discovering the Archaeologists of Europe project, 3.5%. So that was then maybe about approximately that number of, of people. Some of them were bigger characters than others, but I thought it was a convenient <laughs> photograph that I put find these there. Thanks, Ray. And then... No. Okay. All right. There we go. There's another little slide to think about that relatively... Now, annoyingly, now I've put up a slide that said there's 168 European archaeologists working in the UK, and Kevin has produced a figure, because I couldn't find any figures for the numbers of UK archaeologists working elsewhere in the European Union. You suggested 200 people? Ah, so it's more. Ah, so my, my argument begins to fall down a little bit there. I, I, I think 168 is a big underestimate of the number of uh, EU First Nationals currently. Yes. Yes. It's, yes. I know one unit alone has at least 60. Yeah, I think <coughs> the, the, those numbers are a little bit out of date because they're 2012, but also, yes, it might well have been an underestimate. So relatively, hmm, okay, relatively quite a lot of UK archaeologists work in the EU, and this will have an effect very specifically on those individuals, even if it's not going to have a great overall effect on European archaeology. Um, essentially, now, this is accepting the island of Ireland. There are no UK companies working elsewhere in the European Union. That's a slide from uh, Canal Saint Nord Europe in France, where Oxford were working in the days when Oxford had offices in France and were looking to do commercial work in France. That came to an end for, for, for reasons that people that worked for Oxford then and people that worked for INRAP then might want to discuss, but it is not for me to elaborate on at the moment. So there are no UK companies working beyond the Republic of Ireland in the European Union. And there are, I say no EU companies working in, the G, in GB, as opposed to UK, of course, because there are Irish companies working, Irish companies from both sides of the currently soft border, working in both parts of, of the island of Ireland, 
and I say no EU companies working in, in GB, but of course Arcadis are actually working in, in Britain and I know that there's uh, at I least have to add that Arcadis is a Dutch firm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Here is a are you still an Arcadis employee, Mark? No, but I'm in good standing with them. Yeah. So. But I know that the Arcadis are represented at the conference. So so what I'm kind of trying to say is that the the effect on European archaeology is minimal because it isn't changing British companies, British firms being able to do commercial archaeology there. A little bit more about uh, effects in Britain, but I'm trying not to talk about effects in Britain today. Britain. L listen to me using accidentally the wrong phrase when I mean United Kingdom. The, there are things that are there that are not going to change. Not going to change in, in Britain immediately, not going to change in Europe. The environmental impact regulations coming from an EEC regulation in the days when the EU, before it was called the EC, when it was called European Economic Community, EEC 1985 Economic Impact Regulations, in turn stemming from United States 1968 National Preservation Act, are in place across Europe and have been were in French law even before 1985. And the way that the the work on the the archaeological work at Channel Tunnel was carried out. Even the stuff in on the English side of the, the tunnel was done under French law at that time, in, in the 80s. These things are not going to change across Europe. Britain leaving is not going to change the way that environmental impact assessment is done in Europe. The a, a thing that some people might think about having an impact will be through university archaeology fieldwork. No. Nathan said to me, why are you putting up such an irrelevant slide? He's seen my slides, I didn't see his. Why, why am I putting up such an irrelevant slide of, of Montbourg, who was an uh, unsuccessful candidate for the Party Socialist uh, presidential candidate this time round? Here he is tramping through the, through, tramping through the Port de Rebu. It's the biggest gate at Montbeuvray, a uh, late Iron Age uh, oppidum in, in France. That slide is up there because that is the very first place I ever dug as a UK student, digging in France all exactly there. And then a few years later, it was the first place that I went back where I was the site director, was Responsable du Chantier, I was a license in my name. So it's a very important place for me in terms of UK archaeology fieldwork from universities. But that, I was there in 1990. That was before, before we, had, we actually had true freedom of movement, it made no difference. And it will continue to make no difference to UK archaeology, UK universities digging elsewhere in Europe. Remember what the Bluffers Guide says about, uh, about fieldwork in, in Europe. It's, it's all about getting to go somewhere where it's nice and it's sunshine and, and there's convenient wine and convenient local lovers or whatever Bluffers Guide says is the reason why fieldwork happens elsewhere in Europe. Right, I don't have very much time, and I know that uh, Nathan has to finish off. It's also thinking about UK field practice has not spread like uh, ideas of, of an idea virus across Europe. The way things are done in all, all countries in the world, not just in Europe, is fieldwork practice is so parochial, the way we do it is right, says every <coughs> single country in the world. This might not be the way that British commercial archaeology would excavate a, a cemetery. The different UK fieldwork practice is just not does it ha does not and will not have an impact on the way things are physically done on the ground. And the last thing, we're not leaving Council of Europe, and so the Letter Convention and the other uh, COE conventions continue to apply in Europe and will not change with Britain leaving. So I think I return back to Nathan to, to finish the her set. Since I fundamentally disagree with you. Super. <laughs> this is the point. We, we, we set this up in the first place on the basis that, that we, we're friends and we, we cooperate on different projects, but we do fundamentally disagree on so many things. So, <laughs> so, you're right. what you know so I can even tell you why I fundamentally Mel's disagree with you, uh, <laughs> which is a, your view about, uh, I think there will be profound and, um, and lasting impact of Brexit on European archaeology. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and I am um, uh, saddened that your view is very narrow and sectorial. Uh, it's simply in terms of employment, etc. And there are a lot of other major issues uh, at stake. Um, 
just to use it, I, I found in Sarkar, I don't know if you've seen the photograph, if you have uh, similar cases in, um, uh, in this country of uh, police protection on uh, archaeological uh, evaluation work, uh, this is this is something similar to our. Um, um, you have the Newbury bypass, yeah. So Notre Dame des Landes is an airport that um, uh, is uh, being projected by all kind of uh, at local level as well, municipal, uh, regional, etc. But it will generate a lot of objection. So you have here the archaeologists who are on the front line of heritage, and because they are the guys with the jackets and identifiable as so, they are also the targets of resistance. Okay, a very interesting uh, situation. So. Uh, the impact of uh, Brexit on uh, European archaeology. First of all, the issue of language. Remember that uh, the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, is the only country which has its only uh, official language, English. There, when it withdraws, there is no reason for us to parler l'anglais. Okay? Uh, there is no, um, I, I don't know if the powers that be, this is not an archaeological question, it's much more major. Uh, why should we continue uh, using English? Okay? Uh, and uh, both the European instances, but also, for example, the funding bodies, all right? Uh, back to Latin, of course. Uh, remember that English, um, English is uh, it's a very tricky issue because English is a vernacular of these little people on this little island, and it's also a vehicular language at, at the global level, okay? And you uh, native locals don't seem to realize these double levels, uh, and you actually uh, make the most, you profit from uh, the vehicular universal dimension in order to put forward your, uh, uh, your vernacular local issues. But that, that's a different... So uh, are, we going to, are we going to have three years... Uh, is the Commission going to decide uh, three years the dossiers will be in German and then three years after uh, the funding body will be in Italian and in Spanish and so on? And that's not only important for the language because you'll always get uh, translators or people to do it. It's important for the evaluators, okay? Because it's the evaluators from many different countries who have to read the dossier, and they need to be able to uh, do this. So that's that's a that's a tricky point that actually you need to think about it. It goes much beyond uh, archaeology, but it will also impact on it. Uh, the second point, sorry, the issue of uh, funding. Okay, so uh, funding and collaboration. So we are all for it. I myself, uh, as you know, maybe benefited very much when I came here to do my MPhil and PhD and uh, junior research fellow in. Uh, in a uh, nice British university, so I, I, I benefited from the system immensely, uh, and I collaborated, I organized projects with Oxford and with uh, Durham and, um, and ADS in York and so on and so forth, so it's all very nice. But clearly the, uh, the slide that you showed earlier, uh, that comes from the latest issue of uh, British archaeology, is, is very shocking for a European, right? <laughs> because you, it, this is the success, the success of the English scholar uh, is the success of, uh, it's, it's a looting exercise uh, uh, that is done, uh, the H, uh, the Horizon, um, uh, the, um, six, the panel six for uh, history in the past, has been, uh, has been uh, well, I don't know if we can mention names, uh, professors in Cambridge, in Oxford, uh, professors in Newcastle, uh, in Southampton, or he was in Southampton and came back to Southampton, uh, people were actually monopolized and uh, quite shamelessly, if I may say so, uh, had managed to make it such, in, in years where you have 12 uh, project on archaeology, uh, seven of them, uh, or eight of them, are to British universities. Okay, So there's no doubting the excellence, right, this is the criteria, there's no doubting the excellence of scholarship in, in uh, British university. Uh, but the head start that British university has is on the one hand the language, right, it's in English, you have no problem to convey, to communicate, to construct these five pages and then these 15 pages of the dossier. And the second point, of course, is that uh, you are used since uh, Thatcher and uh, Tony Blair to this project um, uh, project mentality of building things that last three years uh, that do not require, do not seem to require long, uh, long-term structural uh, generation-like funding or generation-like approach. Okay, that is much easier. So, uh, from my point of view, in a sense, good riddance. Okay, there'll be uh, hopefully uh, more money in this respect for uh, for our colleagues. Uh, another aspect that is very important, of course, is the human resources. So you, you will complain now that you don't have enough, uh, you know, the Poles that were in Ireland and that couldn't go back to Poland because they were all kind of requirements in Poland. Uh, you won't be able to access them when you eventually do uh, HS2 or whatever, all these big, uh, all these big projects. But uh, think about it, I'm trying to be commercial for a second. Think about it, what's happening in Europe. In Europe there is less market, yes, the market or the outlet of our bright or not so bright shovel bombs 
uh, is blocked to England. That means that there's more of them in Europe, okay? And that means that we... Five minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, and that means that we can, uh, that means that we can actually, uh, uh, you know, commercially think about it differently. Likewise, our bright minds, the postdoc and the people who will not come here, they will stay in Europe. It's also good news. Um, and the last um, uh, point here is the perception, uh, before I get to the conclusion, is the per perception of, um, um, again, it's being provocative, um, uh, the, 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 there's a mixture here of two different things that you want to argue, the, the Little England and uh, Global Britain. So we just heard from Kenny that uh, even in a situation where you have the Valletta Convention and you have infrastructure and you have like-minded colleagues, uh, commercial archaeology doesn't get a foothold on, on the continent. Okay, so how can you imagine uh, a question? How can you imagine that commercial archaeology will be successful uh, in places where you don't have the predisposition to undertaking uh, archaeology as part of uh, heritage uh, management? Uh, and then, the second thing, of course, Little England. All this project about uh, Englishness uh, will now be looked at with suspicion. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the, the very interesting project Chris Gostin was doing one, and uh, other people are doing projects on what it means to be English and so forth. And from now on. Uh, for example, funding bodies, when I have to evaluate such projects, I will be suspicious, unfortunately, because it will, uh, it will seem to fit together with an agenda that is related uh, locally. So, uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, so, you need to be pessimistic in analysis and optimistic in action. Yes, you need to expect the worst and uh, behave as if the best is possible. Um, uh, can we ensure that the English disease does not propagate elsewhere? Okay, that the English patient come back to its sense and rejoins the fault. So you have photographs of uh, French archaeologists' work. Uh, I'll skip this one because I'm already behind schedule. And the last one, I'm fine. Okay. So, uh, uh, in order for uh, let, let's say, let's say that we want to avoid a Frexit, Frexit, or a Itaxit, or a Sfaxit, or whatever. Uh, we, we want to, let's say that our aim, or the Dutch, uh, how are we going to proceed? Uh, what, how is our archaeological, uh, from an archaeological point of view, not a general citizen, uh, what are we going to look for, the weak point, what are the predispositions, retrospectively, that made it possible here in this country for taking this decision? Okay. And some of them I mentioned earlier, the issues of authority, the issue of expertise, the issue of the, of the balance of the relation between the central and the local, uh, could be could be thought uh, and uh, precise in, in a slightly different uh, in a slightly different way, and then the, the last point, of course, I said no navel gazing in French archaeology. So uh, hopefully, uh, so this is um, this is one of the um, um, uh, this is the if you recognize the steps of the uh, Opéra Garnier uh, in Paris uh, in 1998. You can see from that this is a photograph of a television set from uh, 1998. Um, about uh, a protest of uh, French archaeology because the government uh, actually conceded to the unlawful uh, destruction of uh, some Roman building by the local mayor. And uh, these people, some of you who, uh, who go to the EAA on a regular basis may recognize. Uh, I don't know how, how personally, but some, some of the people are here. <laughs> and, um, and they, uh, I think, provide you, uh, in the spirit of Gramsci, yes, pessimistic in the lines, optimistic in action. Uh, this is a challenge for you. Uh, a flash mob, yes, uh, on uh, in the summer because otherwise it's called in on the steps of the British Museum, okay. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, take a date to summer, so 18th is occupied. Take the 23rd of uh, 23rd of June, yeah, our first Independence Day, <laughs> uh, and you stand there, and there'll be uh, uh, only you know the heavyweight or the more slender people from uh, English heritage, uh, from uh, um, historic England. Uh, of course, CIFA, all the ten and a half uh, members of CIFA will be there. Why not the people from DCMS? Uh, to, uh, in order to stand and protest and make sure that, uh, that your voice is heard. Thank you very much. Thank you.